All right, everybody, welcome back to the podcast. Our guests today are the authors of a controversial new book called White Rural Rage, The Threat to American Democracy. Tom Schaller is a professor of political science at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And Paul Waldman is a journalist and opinion writer. Gentlemen, welcome to the news. Thanks. Good to be here. Thanks, Matt. Great to talk with you. And I want to start with the fourfold threat that you say white rural Americans pose to democracy. Talk about that, if you would. Yeah, let me take that one, if uh, you don't mind, Matt. Uh, this is what really set off the controversy in our appearance on MSNBC. And, and I maybe could have been a little, had a little better bedside manner there. We are not saying anywhere in the book that this applies to every rural white American, nor are we saying that these impulses and attitudes and beliefs are limited to either white people or rural Americans. There are many people who have strong authoritarian tendencies. There are white Christian nationals who live in the cities and in the suburbs. There are people who have strongly xenophobic anti-sentiments all over America, of course. But what the polling shows is, and as we document in detail in chapter six, that when you look at Racial animosity, whether it's measured in terms of attitudes toward Black Lives Matter or attitudes toward the cities, when you look at anti-immigrant sentiment, sentiment, when you look at attitudes toward gays, uh, the Trevor Project asked rural youth if it's accommodating to be gay in rural America, and 50% of them said it's not. That's the highest rate of any region in the country. Basically, when you look at xenophobia generally, people who don't look, in, think, act, or pray similarly to most, most white rural Americans, uh, rural whites rate the highest or the lowest, depending on how you're measuring it. Secondly, whether you're looking at election denialism, whether you're looking at COVID denialism and vac vaccine skepticism, whether you're looking at <clears throat> Barack Obama birtherism, the belief that he isn't a legitimate president because he wasn't born in the United States, or most, you know, frighteningly, when you look at subscription to QAnon belief systems, including that there's a national pedophile network run by Hillary Clinton and John Podesta, where they're kidnapping, raping, and then killing and drinking the blood of children in some basement in Washington, D.C. of a pizza shop that didn't even turn out to have a basement. Conspiracism rates highest among rural white Americans in survey after survey. Thirdly, and we draw a lot here on, on our colleague, Suzanne Mettler, and her two fantastic PhD students, Trevor Brown and Olivia Puzzi up at Cornell University, who are studying at length urban and rural differences in attitudes in terms of support of an independent media, in terms of support of free speech, in terms of belief in Christian nationalism or white nationalism, rural whites are at the forefront. And that we shouldn't be surprised by that. 43% of rural Americans are <clears throat> white evangelicals, and only 76% of rural America is white to begin with. So that means more than one out of two white people in rural America is a white evangelical, and 60% of them are self-described white Christian nationalists, according to all the white Christian national scholars. Andrew Whitehead, Philip Gorski, Sam Perry, Sarah Posner, uh, Catherine Stewart, and of course, Tim Alberta in his new book. And people who are subscribed to white Christian nationalism basically believe one of five beliefs, all of which are about essentially a, a theocracy where the Bible should supersede our constitutional democracy or that you have to be Christian to be a true American. These are antithetical belief systems to a secular, constitutional, and plural democracy that has an establishment clause clearly stated in the Constitution. And then last but not least, the fourth threat is that uh, white rural Americans exhibit high levels of not violent activities, but the defense or excusing of violence, particularly violence committed by people like Donald Trump and what happened on January 6th. They're also most likely to agree to the statement that Joe Biden stole the election and that Trump should be returned by force if necessary, or that they may have to take up arms to protect the country. And so People say you're stereotyping, you're, you're name calling, you're picking on people. And, and to use an old sports metaphor, I'm a kind of a sports guy. I used to be a freelance sports writer back in my days at Chapel Hill. You know, it's not cocky if you back it up. And it's not a stereotype if the data back it up, Matt. And as you noted, I mean, that, that appearance on Morning Joe mm -hmm. last week, MSNBC's Morning Joe, uh, spawned a lot of a lot of YouTube videos. I didn't didn't see a lot of think pieces, but it, it spawned a lot of, of con, you know, sort of uh backlash and all that i'm gonna play one of them if the technology works we'll see uh this is michael knowles um and like to be honest a lot of the pushback i don't think carried any water michael knowles cites specific arguments i'm not sure he has his facts right we could talk about 
that on the other side. Nobody seriously believes that white rural voters pose the gravest threat of violence. According to every statistic we've got, whites are significantly less likely than blacks and Hispanics to commit violent crime. And cities are twice as violent as rural areas, not just in the aggregate, but per capita. So when we're talking about white rural voters, we're talking about pretty much, not quite, but almost the least violent group in the country. They're certainly not the most racist. They're the least racist. Pew Research has shown for years now that whites have virtually no racial consciousness whatsoever. Unlike every other race, every other race which has rates of racial consciousness anywhere from three to almost five times that of whites. Homophobic? What a ridiculous word. And again, not true. Whites are far and away the most accepting group when it comes to light loafers. Hispanics and especially blacks are significantly less likely to be down with the friends of Dorothy than the whites are. It's not even close. But all of that actually is beside the point. Even if the claims that these guys are making were true, how would that threaten democracy? Homophobia threatens democracy? So there you have it. Any comments or anything he got wrong there? Well, I don't know exactly which statistics he's referring to. Um, you know, it's, there, there are some things there that are sort of true, that crime tends to be higher in cities than in rural areas, but crime is a serious problem in rural areas too. And this gets to, just to, to, to go on this for a moment, this gets to something that we talk about a lot in, in the book is that one of the messages that rural people get all the time through all kinds of different channels is that cities are dangerous and kind of depraved and uh, this sort of horrifying uh, source of everything that's bad in the world, then you should hate them and fear them and the people who live there are nothing like you. And whenever there's, say, a bump in crime in urban America, you know, Fox News will go just go to town on it for months and months talking about how awful things are in San Francisco and Chicago. But, you know, for instance, in 2020, there was an increase in crime everywhere. There was an increase in crime in red states, in blue states, in cities, and in rural areas. There was, according to some data, about a 25 increase in homicides in rural areas in 2020. It was happening everywhere where there are progressive prosecutors and conservative prosecutors. But all we heard was that this was happening in places like Chicago and San Francisco that had these progressive prosecutors. And that was the explanation for crime. Nobody paid any attention to the crime increase in rural areas and how that might be affecting the people who live there. And now crime has gone down for the last couple of years, uh, pretty dramatically. Again, in places where there are progressive prosecutors and conservative prosecutors and in red states and in blue states, for instance, and you know, there was just a, uh, a report that Third Way did where they looked at uh, violent crime rates in red states and blue states. And just to, it put an extra thumb on the scale for the red states, they took out the biggest city in each one of the red states, and they still found that crime was significantly higher in red states than it was in blue states. So we see that we see that all over. It kind of creates this this sort of pervasive belief that um, that this kind of stuff only happens where those people live, and those are the people you have to hate and fear. You know, one of the, the stories we tell. I don't know if you may remember this. In 2022. Uh, the contestants for Oklahoma governor were having a debate and the incumbent, Kevin Stitt, said something about crime and his Democratic opponent said, actually, you know, crime rates in Oklahoma are higher than they are in New York or California. And he literally laughed in her face and said, can you believe that, that she just said the crime is higher in California and New York than it is in Oklahoma? She just said that. And of course, it was true. Um, but because that myth is so pervasive, um, people just just can't seem to believe it. So uh, that's one of the just one of the aspects of uh, the way that I think this there's a sort of a, a kind of a cultural uh, uh, ethos that's built up around what it means to be rural and what it means to be urban and what divides those places. Yeah. Now, I mean, well, we start the book off talking about um, uh, that Jason Aldean song, Try That in a Small Town, you know, which is, again, all about this uh, this idea that cities are dangerous and people in rural areas take care of each other and that's just an example of how it comes through so many different channels to build up that myth and convince people that that's, that's what reality is. Yeah, talk about I, I'm interested in the fact that there is this veneration or lionization of rural areas. And I think it goes back, I don't know, to the Garden of Eden, maybe, uh, maybe to Thomas Jefferson more recently in American history. Um, but there is this 
sense that, uh, you know, salt of the earth, real America, uh, heartland, all, all of these terms are examples of how we venerate the rural areas. Yeah. And, and you people. know, the, it's, it can be a complex picture at times and rural people have a legitimate gripe with the way they're often portrayed in the media. You know, as we mentioned in the book, you know, there are 10 different insults to throw at people from rural area, hillbilly, hick, yokel, mm -hmm. all of those things. And we don't have a similar list for people who live in cities. And they are correct when they say that there are a lot of representations of them in media are like Beverly Hillbillies, you know, where they're wearing overalls and shooting off guns all the time. But at the same time, there's also a very common kind of story that's presented of the rural parts of our country as the places that are honest and true and have values. And we hear that from politicians all the time. We need small town values, that that's where the real Americans reside. And then I think that also transfers over to the way that reporters treat them. And, uh, you know, it's it's there's an irony there, which is that reporters are often themselves, you know, northeastern uh, elite people who went to fancy colleges uh, and they have kind of uh, incorporated this belief into their worldview that the people out in the heartland are the real Americans. And that's why you have to go and treat them with great respect and veneration. And, you know, you'll never see a politician get up and say, you know, we need more big city values in Washington. <laughs> but, you know, you can yeah, make an I argument that maybe we do. Uh, there's a lot of good things about cities that help you govern. You know, cities are constantly changing and they're dynamic and they have a lot of different kinds of people. And uh, but nobody's ever going to say that because small town values is a thing that we're supposed to be seeking after. Yeah, if I could add a little something to that, Matt. Right. Um Faith is different than religiosity and participation in the church. But the cooperative election study, I think it's more than 2,000 people were polled in it. It was re-reported in the Daily Yonder, which is the online magazine for rural America, and their lead reporter, Sarah Malata, a fantastic reporter. If anybody doesn't want to listen to some giant cooperative election study conducted by a bunch of college professors on some elite eastern campus, 58% of people in urban America <clears throat> go to church either seldom or never. I'm sorry, I'm batting a little winter cold. You know what the percentage is in rural America? 57%. So we hear this stuff about how they love their country and they love their church and they love their families and they leave their doors unlocked. And some of that's true. You can leave your door unlocked more in a rural area. You can, uh, people do know their neighbors more in smaller communities just by the numerics of it. I've lived in a city. I've lived in a building in DC previously would had nine floors and 140 units. I lived there for seven years. I probably only knew six of my neighbors by name, right? You know, and people were rotating in. And now mostly professionals, there was probably only three or four people with kids. It is a different lifestyle in the cities versus the country. But our view is the sort of Tina Fey, who I consider my TV girlfriend, Tina Fey's 30 Rock view. Nobody's more real than anybody else. Everybody just wants their sandwich and a quiet place and a diet Sprite to have their lunch. And the sandwiches may differ in different parts of the country. There may be more barbecue in rural areas and there may be more avocado toast in the cities. But nobody's more real. A 65-year-old white guy who grew up in southwestern Oklahoma in a county of 15,000 people that's 95% white is no more real than an Afro-Latino 22-year-old single woman who's growing up in Brooklyn and hustling around driving Uber. So let's just dispense with the notion about who's more real and who's less real and start to have a national conversation about bringing the nation together and saving us from the brink of losing our democracy. I don't want to linger too long on the whole backlash thing. But this one of the advantages of I didn't get you guys the first week the book was out. So now we can do a little bit of navel gazing, maybe. But I don't want to dwell on this too much. But let me just say, you know, so technically I'm a rural white evangelical. I mean, by definition, I literally am. Um, of course, I'm, you know, a never Trump uh, conservative. But, you know, I know a lot of people like in my church who are great people. If I needed something, they would do it. Um, if your car breaks down, they'll come and, you know, help you change your tire at two o'clock in the morning. Um, also, they'll vote for Donald Trump. And uh, I'm sure you have friends and family who, who maybe also fit into that category. Um, some of them may think that this is not an academic pursuit, but that there's an agenda uh, behind why talk about this. Maybe it's true, maybe it isn't, but why, why go there? Have you gotten any pushback, not just from you know, uh, randos on Twitter or, or right wing YouTube, you know, sensations. But have you heard anything from friends and family? Well, my parents are white evangelicals, if I can go first, uh, even though a lot of the hate mail comes in is calling me a variety of anti-Semitic names. I guess they assume because Paul is Jewish 
and then I wear glasses or something. And I guess my last name starts S C H, so a lot of Jewish surnames start S C H. Uh, so I get a lot of terms thrown at me that I will not repeat on your podcast. But my parents are white evangelicals, and I had a conversation with them about about this just last week. And I said, you know, at the Civil War, there were people who held up the Bible and said, this is this slavery is deprived, and these people are human; they're not animals. But there were people who held up the Bible who said God believes in the separate that the, we are the superior race. And I can say the same during the suffragette movement and people who said women are subordinate to their men held up the Bible and other people said, no, women are equal to the men and they should have the right to vote. And I could do the civil rights movement. And I could do the gay rights movement. There are people who hold up the Bible on either side. And I'm not trying to pick on people who are Christian or believe in the Bible, but it either means that document is very confusing and easily subject to interpretation and manipulation, or there have been people on the right side and the wrong side at every one of these moments. And I don't know about your, your, your fellow congregants and parishioners, but I bet you if we asked them the five questions in the poll that just came out two days ago from PRRI and said, you know, if you had the opportunity to replace the Constitution of the Bible, would you? And you might find some surprising answers, Matt. I'm not saying that you would. You maybe go to a very enlightened church. But I don't want to live in a theocracy. And I was raised Catholic, right? I know the Bible. I was a Sunday school teacher in 10th grade of fourth graders. And, you know, I was involved in the God Squad, the retreat club, uh, you know, for my St. Thomas Paris in Little Del Mar, New York. So I, I, you can live a, a Christian life. You can take care of your neighbors. You can turn the other cheek. You can do unto others. You can live by Jesus's stump speech, the Beatitudes, which is not about you know, making wealthy people powerful and cutting their taxes. It's about helping the meek and the poor in spirit, uh, whether you're Christian or not. And of course, you know, as well as I do, that a lot of these principles uh, transcend uh, specific religions and even specific texts. So yeah, I think we're getting pushed back because people view it as an attack on their religion. They view it as an attack on their race, and they view it as an attack on their place, ruralness. And again, it's a selective critique to the people for whom it applies. And it's not a yeah. universal critique, and it's not limited to white rural America. I think I feel like I needed to say that on MSNBC, and I'll own that. That's that's my failure. Well, I will, say, I will say something else about the backlash, too, is that you know we knew that this was going to be a provocative argument, and... You know, the title that our publisher chose was about as in your face as you could get. Uh, so none of this is that surprising to us. But I'll say it, it has come in a few different forms. There are, you know, for instance, academics who study rural America and activists who work in rural America, who many of them had a kind of an initial reaction against it just when they saw the title and maybe saw the first couple of things about it before they read the book. And those are people that we are very eager to engage with and we're, and we're already engaging with to try to, you know, talk about these things in more detail. And, you know, then there's going to be the kind of angry stuff. Um, I noticed that there is a trending uh, hashtag white rural rage on Twitter, some of which is, is actually nice. It's people in rural America just, you know, posting a picture of them, of, you know, the sunset over their farm and saying, here's my white rural rage. Um, and that's, and that's nice. Um, some of it is less so nice. Like you should <laughs> see all the Nazis in my mentions. I won't go into that too much, but, um, you know, I, I, we knew it was going to have a reaction and yeah. we expected that. Um, and we are trying to have a more detailed conversation with the people who were approaching it in good faith. I think it's a happy dilemma. If you write a book, you want people talking about it. People are talking about it. I consider it a win. Let's move on. I want to ask you about Donald Trump, right? This guy's a rich New Yorker who had sex with a porn star. Help us understand why the salt of the earth, good folk out uh, in the heartland uh, in middle America love. The, they don't just vote for him reluctantly, love Donald J. Trump. Yeah, well, this is the this is the irony, right? Because for so long, what we've been told about rural Americans is that they really need to make a connection with you in order to consider voting for you. You need to go there. You need to listen. You need to understand what their lives are like. And sometimes, you know, politicians do it in a pretty ham handed way. You know, you remember like before the Iowa caucuses, John Kerry went duck hunting and stuff like that. Um, but uh, but that's really the essence of what what has long been believed and what Democrats tell other Democrats is that you need to you need to show up and listen. And it turns out that uh, for Democrats, that's necessary, but not sufficient. But the irony is here comes Donald Trump. No one could possibly be further from the lives of rural Americans than he is. You know, he grew up in Queens, never wanted anything more than to be accepted by the Manhattan Brahmin society. Uh, he, you know, as I think we me make a joke in the in the book that he couldn't tell a combine from a corn dog and yet they love him so much and so 
the reasons why are uh, complicated, but it gets back to kind of the primary theme of our book, this kind of anger and resentment. It turned out that when he offered them this kind of unadorned version of something that they had been getting sort of pieces of uh, kind of culture war things, that, that, that basic questions of identity, it turns out that the, that the identity piece that they were looking for wasn't so much I'm like you when I have the same experience as you, is that it's that I, uh, I, I express myself in some of the same ways you do, and I will be a channel for your anger and your resentment, and I will stick it to the people that you hate. And this is something, you know, in our reporting, as we were going around to rural places and all over, the, all over the country, we kept hearing this again and again, people saying, well, you know, Donald Trump really speaks our language. And at first, you, that seems so strange. But what they were, what they really meant was that, you know, he swears and he's cruel and he's vulgar. And that was something that we had never seen before from somebody. And it turned out that that really kind of tickled them in places uh, that they had been yearning for. And so, you know, there's other parts of his personality that you can point to and say, oh, well, you know, you can draw a connection between his own, you know, for instance, his own resentments and his own kind of petty grievances. And it turned out I, I saw one academic study that showed that people who were uh, who were most likely to express the, the, the sentiment that they had been kind of ripped off by life. Those people were more likely to support Trump, even when you control for their their party affiliation and their uh, political ideology. That really connected with them, people who felt like they had been done wrong. And he is somebody who is constantly bitching and moaning about how he's been treated unfairly. And a lot of people made a connection to that. And, you know, to to repeat, like there are a lot of people in rural America who have a legitimate case that they have been treated unfairly by the world. Yeah. They have a lot of very legitimate grievances. And it turned out that what, what they were looking for was not somebody who would actually kind of address those in a in a concrete material way but somebody who would just address the kind of emotion, the sentiment that underlay them. Right. I mean, so right. Rural, rural Americans have a lot of, you know, serious problems, opioids, lack of, you know, opioid addiction, lack of jobs, depression. Um, as you note in, in white rural rage, nine out of every 10 Americans who kill themselves with a gun are white. I did not know that. Is it your contention that they feel like they've got nothing left to lose, that they've essentially written off the possibility of um, fixing the economic problems that they're facing. And so that frees them up to just own the libs. Is that basically what it is? This is what's fascinating. If you're a Democrat or Republican, old or young, white or non-white, and 24% of rural America is non-white, and we'd like to talk a little bit about, and we dedicate an entire chapter to race and rurality in the book for, for a sincere reason and a strategic reason, which we can get into later. Basically, what Paul and I concluded is they look at the two parties to varying degrees, but for the most part, the same in terms of saving the economic and healthcare. care uh, life and lifestyle of rural America. And there's a certain logic and legitimacy to that conclusion. For example, you could get all the Democrats and the Republicans in Congress to vote on a bill to say, please stop globalization. Other countries aren't allowed to make products cheaper and pay children uh, a, a, a 10 cents an hour and no bathroom breaks and no environmental regulation. And you could pass that law unanimously in Congress. That's not going to stop it. You could pass a law to say, we're going to stop technology. And so you can't have a mountaintop removal system that blows the top off of a coal mine and then scoops all the coal out instead of drilling a hole in the side and sending guys with their lunch pails back in the old Matewan movie. And we went to Mingo County, as you know, having read the book, with their lunch pails between their knees and picking it out a pound at a time with pickaxes and shovels. And so we can bring all those jobs back. You can't vote away technology. You can't vote away globalization. So once you get to the conclusion that, like, look, whether it's NAFTA, which Trump called the worst trade deal of all time, or whether it's USMCA, which policy analysis say is like 93 percent identical to NAFTA and the parts that Trump changed, which created the China tariffs, we just told you in this new National uh, Bureau of Economic Research are actually destroying rural communities, even though it's widely popular there. Uh, those trade deals are, are limited in terms of the capacity they are can fix what's actually helping hurting rural America. On the healthcare side, why are rural hospitals, why are rural pharmacies, why are rural drug and alcohol treatment clinics folding? Because they don't turn a profit. And the ones that stay open are usually subsidized in a, a larger regional network by the suburban and urban hospitals who pick up the tab. Socialism, if you will, right? Why are mom and pop shops being replaced by dollar stores and family general? That's capitalism. You want to vote away capitalism? The people in my mentions and the people in my email box are screaming at me as a socialist while their communities are being destroyed by late stage capitalism. 
So once you get to the conclusion that neither party is going to fix our economic woes, nobody's going to bring back these pharmacies, you might as well vote on the social issues because the Republicans are different on choice. They did elect Donald Trump. He did appoint Supreme Court justices, and they did reverse Roe v. Wade. They are fighting against trans rights. They are fighting critical race theory, whatever that demon is. They are, you know, emphasizing the border. So there's a certain logic. We don't say white rural people are dumb. We just say that they need to, to, to vote for a better class of Republican because that's who represents them. They don't hold them accountable. Democrats and liberals and, and, and minorities are always held accountable on Fox News and talk radio for any small infraction that happens in a city. One person got killed by an immigrant this week and the entire conservative architecture shut down to talk about that poor girl who we all sympathize with. Right. But nobody wants to talk about the fact that, you know, disability rates for Social Security are higher in rural America or that the crime rate is, as Paul pointed out, higher per capita in Oklahoma, and California and New York. That's literally a laughable issue to the governor of California who doesn't even know what the crime rate in his, is in his state, one of the whitest states in the union and one of only three states where Donald Trump carried every single county both times. So why not just vote on the person who, who, who picks at your little rage scabs? And, and your culture work and sells you culture work claptrap like my pronouns or kiss my ass. Ted Cruz, who's got the, a state with 254 counties, the vast, of which, vast majority of which are rural white counties. And what has he delivered to them in 20 years in Congress? Nada. Um, one of the things you write about in the book is how uh, rural whites have a disproportionate amount of political power in terms of their numbers. Talk about why that's the case and why that hasn't served to quell their their anger i mean they should be maybe happy they've got well there's a <laughs> yeah there's there's a couple different ways in which it manifests so the obvious ones are the electoral college which gives more power to rural states you know why uh and the senate you know wyoming six hundred thousand people get the same two senators as california's 39 million so those are kind of built into the structure and are probably never going to change right and then you have what happens at the state level where republicans are often able to draw district lines in ways that uh, kind of do a sort of rural gerrymander that enables them to keep control of state legislatures, basically on the backs of rural voters. We saw that that was definitely true in Wisconsin, although now there's a new Supreme Court in Wisconsin, they're changing the lines. Uh, I'll give you another example that's going on right now that I think most people probably haven't heard of. In Missouri, uh, the Republicans in the legislature have been very unhappy about the fact that they have ballot measures and the citizens of Missouri keep choosing kind of progressive positions on ballot measures. They uh, voted to accept the expansion of Medicaid and from the Affordable Care Act. They voted to legalize marijuana. They voted to increase the minimum wage. They voted to nullify a right to work law that the legislature had passed. So the state Republicans came up with a solution and they have a bill that has now passed the state Senate and it's on its way to the state house. That what it would do is it says that if you were going to have a, uh, a ballot initiative, not only does it have to win a majority in the state as a whole, it also has to win a majority in at least five of the eight congressional districts. It's kind of an electoral college for ballot initiatives. Mm. Now, what does it have to do with real voters? Well, it turns out that of the eight congressional districts, according to the Bloomberg City Lab classifications, which are very precise, uh, two of the congressional districts in, in Missouri are what they consider pure rural, and another three are rural suburban mix. And so you're essentially giving rural voters kind of a veto over whatever the, the, the state as a whole wants. And we know that Republicans in Missouri have thought of this before. When the, when the Medicaid expansion passed and uh, the legislature tried to take some steps to undermine it, eventually it got overturned by the court. So the people are now signing up. But, uh, but at one point, one of the state reps, uh, the Republican state rep, when she was asked why they were trying to overturn the will of the voters, she said, well, rural Missouri said no, because the ballot initiative hadn't didn't get a majority in rural areas. And so there are examples like that through gerrymandering where, where it's not just built into the system and is unchanging, but is kind of an ongoing effort to, uh, to kind of enhance rural power. And I should say, uh, you know, you mentioned Ted Cruz. This is just one other case. Every once in a while, the rural representatives who we have a real critique of as a group, they do the right thing. In Texas, there's a, a voucher plan that, that Greg Abbott is really set on, a school voucher plan. And rural people that vouchers don't do anything for them. Why? Because in most rural places, there are no private schools. Even if you wanted to take advantage of them, you couldn't. And so the public schools are very important. There was a rural voucher plan in Texas and rural representatives got together with Democrats and they killed it. And now in the current election, Greg Abbott is trying to like take revenge on all those rural representatives and get them primaried. 
Um, so this stuff happens kind of all over the place where the interests of uh, interests of rural people are often at odds with either the state Republican Party or even some of the people who represent them. And, and one thing you noted is the founders, you know, created this electoral college and that was part of this compromise to start our, our nation. What I didn't appreciate until reading your book is that the ratio between the largest and the smaller states has increased by something like 13 fold since then. So the game was already rigged toward smaller states. Now uh, it is like on steroids. Yeah, I mean, and even if you, I mean, look, you use Wyoming and California at 68 to one. So you say that's a little unfair. Let's compare the largest state to the median state. At the founding, the ratio was 2.5 to one. Today, it's six to one. And by the way, the, one of the things that we found was really interesting. You would assume that the Senate is the most malapportioned, which favors rural and smaller and whiter states. And the Electoral College, because it includes the two Senate electors, was next most malapportioned. We didn't expect to find the following. If you use Bloomberg City Lab classifications, and they classify all 435 districts from either purely rural or rural suburban, and then there's two middle categories, and then on the far end, purely urban and urban suburban. The purely rural or rural suburban districts, we'll call them rural influence districts, are 42% of the house. Let's round that down to 40%. The purely urban or urban suburban districts are just 19% of house seats. Let's round that up to 20% to make it an even two to one, 40 to 20. So even though there are more people who live in cities, rural people have twice as much representation in the House of Representatives. It's absurd. It might be even more malapportioned than the Senate. And why is that? Because they pack all the minorities in one district, like in Alabama. They put every African-American they can find in a state that's the third blackest state in the union and give them one seat out of seven. And that's why the courts step in. But here's the other thing that really infuriates us, and we write about this in the book, is that conservatives say the quiet part out loud. After Wisconsin Republicans controlled the state legislature with 64 percent of the seats, even though they only got 46 percent of the votes statewide in the state house races, they complained after Tony Evers won and finally ended Scott Walker's reign by three percent. And here's what they said. This is this is the Wisconsin Republican House Speaker Robin Voss. If you took Madison, Milwaukee out of the state election formula, we would have a clear majority. Can you imagine if Paul and I came on TV and said, if you just eliminated the votes of every Wisconsinite who lives in a county of 20,000 people or fewer, they would have all 10 electoral votes reliably every four years for the Democrats. There'd be no Ron Johnson. They'd have two Senate Democrats in the U.S. Senate. They'd have a majority in the state Senate and the state House, and they'd run the governorship in every statewide office, secretary of state forever. And they would say, how dare you erase us? How dare you eliminate us? Oh, you want to hear from his counterpart, state Senate Majority Leader Scott Fitzgerald? Citizens from every corner of Wisconsin deserve a strong legislative branch that stands on equal footing with an incoming administration that is based almost solely in Madison. So in other words, if you live in Madison, where the university is, and of course, where the state capital is, and that's one of the, Dane County, one of the most liberal counties in the state, because it's government workers and college students and college professors like us, right? Or Milwaukee, the blackest jurisdiction, your vote should count less. They're saying it out loud, Matt. It's unfair and it's wrong. And if we did it and said that about rural Americans, uh, we would be lambaste, lambasted and criticized and with cause. Talk a little bit about that chapter about non-white rural folks. What is what should we know about them? What's interesting? Well, as I said, we wrote that chapter for two reasons. Can I go first, Paul? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. We wrote it for a sincere reason, and we wrote it, frankly, for a strategic reason, which we'll openly admit. The sincere reason is that at 24 percent, would you say, Matt, that since the rise of Donald Trump and all this focus on rural America, 24 percent of the media attention has been on rural Latinos and rural African-Americans and the most rural population in America, Native Americans, not even close. No. Reporters have been climbing over each other like puppies trying to get out of a cardboard box to interview the next eight Trump red hat wearing southeast Missouri rural diners someplace to find out. Lo and behold, Trump voters still love Trump. OK, nobody wants to talk to black Americans. We went to the Albemarle region, which is just over the Virginia border on clustered on both sides. There are seven rural black majority black majority and majority rural counties there, Bertie, Edgecombe, Halifax, Northampton and so forth. And nobody wants to talk to them. We went to the Copper Corridor northeast of Phoenix, which is dominated, has four Latino mayors in this mining town, a uh, very rural part of uh, the outskirts in the sort of northeast corner of Arizona to talk to them and about their experiences. Right. The strategic reason we wrote it, Matt, and we're, we're very naked and plain about this. They are doing worse other than what you pointed out, on, other than opioids and gun deaths, you take any economic measure, poverty, unemployment rates, 
median household income, high school graduations, college participation, um, distressed communities. And then you take any health care measure in terms of mortality rates, life expectancy, access to health care, insurance rates. Rural minorities are doing worse than their white neighbors on every single measure that we could find except for opioid deaths and gun deaths. And so if we're worried about the economic anxieties of rural America, why aren't we worried about their economic anxieties? And if anybody has reason to be mad at America, I didn't even mention the racism they experienced. If anybody has reasons to revolt against the system because it no longer represents them, it's their black and brown neighbors first and then maybe rural white second. But all the attention in the rise of Trump, and to be fair, that's his base of base, is on the white people in rural America and not the non-white people in, in rural America. And we think that's a huge oversight. And so part of the reason we make that argument is to insulate, uh, I'm being perfectly honest with you, to insulate our crit critique of white rural Americans and their dispossessed feelings and their decaying democratic attachments, as we argue in the book, they're losing faith in democracy. But the black and brown people who experience racism from their own white neighbors have steadfastly stayed committed to a country that treats them last. There's a lot of interesting things in the book and thought provoking things. And one point you make is that social media has likely contributed to radicalizing rural white Americans against elites and, and cosmopolitan types. Uh, talk about that. Yeah, th there's a real media story here, which is that, you know, we all, all of us as people who work in the media know, there's a real uh, local news crisis, especially all across the country. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of newspapers have closed. And this is particularly acute in rural places uh, where, you know, there may be no more newspaper, or if there is a newspaper, you know, it was bought up by some private equity firm, and now it doesn't run any local stories. They're not uh, really paying attention to what's going on. And that has a number of really pernicious consequences. First of all, it allows corruption to flourish. You know, I think there's a real misconception among people that like Washington is where the corruption is and you get down to the local level and that's where people are honest. It's often the reverse. But if you've got reporters walking around City Hall asking questions, then that it does a great deal to keep things honest. And once you remove them and uh, people, whether it's in the state legislature or the local local government, they know that nobody's looking over their shoulder. It, the opportunities for corruption just really increase. Second of all, local news tends to bind people to their community uh, in ways that are not necessarily partisan. That, uh, you know, the question of, you know, uh, are, are we going to have a Fourth of July parade this year or is there enough money to do it? Uh, do we want to, you know, revamp the library, whatever it is. Uh, those kinds of questions don't necessarily have a partisan valence, and they allow people to feel really connected to their community. And what happens when you take that stuff away? Well, you end up with this kind of oh, what are often called news deserts. And uh, we argue that they're in some ways they're kind of politics deserts too, but we can get to that. But like, uh, but then what, what fills that space? Well, what fills it is the national stuff. Uh, you know, it's it's going to be Fox News. It's going to be conservative talk radio. It's going to be social media. And that tends to be really polarized, really antagonistic and tell people that everyone who is not on your side, they unlike, you know, if, if you know that you're a Republican and your neighbor's a Democrat uh, and you've known them for years, well, you can have those differences and maybe not have them be so nasty. But if if the people who disagree with you are just an abstraction that you hear being vilified on the media that you see. That's that can be a real problem. And one of the things about social media that it does is it uh, it does it can draw connections between people in different places um, that, you know, if you're somebody who lives in a rural area in Montana, you can see that somebody who who, you know, whose TikTok feed you watch in a rural area in Alabama is a lot like you. But one of the things that happens, you know, Will Wilkinson, who used to be with Cato Institute, has argued this. Uh, very eloquently in a terrific piece he wrote called The Density Divide. I think he's from Iowa. He says that there's been kind of a cultural flattening around rural America where everybody has, you know, the same F-150s and the same, uh, the same American flag oh, yeah, and the same, by the way, the you guys have accent. A, you guys have a great uh, section about pickup trucks. I mean, there are pages and pages and pages. We don't have time to talk about it. But that was one of my favorite parts was about pickup trucks and how everybody owns pickup trucks. Nobody's picking anything up, <laughs> but they, they the pickup truck. Well, that was a great section. I'm, I'm glad you saw that because I could talk about pickup trucks. for Paul, Paul wrote all that. <laughs> Paul really wrote all the great cultural sections, Matt. I just want to tell you, and his, some of his strongest prose is there. And in chapter eight, uh, the concluding chapter, um, you know, if, if I could add a little something to this, 
Um, I'm from upstate New York. I grew up in the suburbs of Albany, but I have spent a lot of time, started college at Plattsburgh in the Adirondack North Country in Elise Stefanik's district. I know all about her. She grew up in Albany, went to private school, went to Harvard. She's about as Adirondacker as, as a, a, an avocado toast, okay? So I have spent a lot of time in Lake Placid, Saranac Lake. And when we went up there to interview, we interviewed four town supervisors. The town supervisor of Malone, Andrea Andy Stewart, the town supervisor of Harriettstown, which is where SLK, the Saranac Lake Airport, where uh, what's his name? Crow flies, uh, you know, uh, Clarence Thomas in on his private jet when they go up to his resort up there. They just redid that with state and federal monies. And they have a brand new airport with a new, nice cafe that's one of the most popular restaurants up in, in uh, it's called Clear Lake is actually where the airport is. Uh, and we talked to Jordana, uh, Jordan uh, Moloch there, Jordana Moloch, who's a Democrat and a war vet who had to run for Election Day while in Iraq and won. Her husband's a Republican. And then we talked to two mayor, two other, excuse me, uh, town supervisors in Essex County, uh, Willsboro, which is where Lisa's home is, although it's her parents summer home. And uh, the town supervisor of Wilmington, which is the town in literally in the shadow of the Olympic Mountain, Whiteface Mountain. And they said to us almost to a fault. I wish the national politics, it's already filtered to Albany. I wish the national politics didn't filter down here because what, what are we trying to do? We're trying to manage short-term rentals, Airbnbs and VRBOs. People come into our town, the, the, the locals want the money, but people are loud and they don't care about the recycling rules and they, they clog up the traffic and the local merchants, right? We're trying to make sure the Lake Placid, one of the biggest cities there, Lake Placid's 24-hour emergency room wants to go to 16 hours and close eight hours overnight. And Roy Holzer, the town supervisor of, of Wilmington, which is about 25, 30 minute drive from there, he's like, if I have to take somebody who has a heart attack or got in a car accident and I can't take them to Champlain Valley Regional Hospital in Lake Placid, I'm going to have to take them either to Plattsburgh or maybe even over the lake, Lake Champlain to Burlington, because the whole local hospital is actually run by the state of Vermont, run by the state of Vermont system, the University of Vermont system. And that might be the literally, and I'm, I'm joking a little bit here, but in all seriousness, that's a life and death matter. Yeah. And he told me that when the university came up, games came up there in February of 2023, we interviewed him in March or April. So she had just been there. Kathy Huckley's like, I cornered her in the Lake Placid Arena, the site, February 22nd, 1980. I'm a big hockey fan, right, of the Miracle on Ice. And he said, you've got to stop this. You've got to keep this point open by hook or by crook, even if it's operating at a loss. And so that's what they care about. They don't want to talk about critical race theory and all that stuff. They're just managers trying to manage local problems without all this highfalutin stuff and people fighting over Trump or not Trump. And but, you know, part it, of the it thing shows before, I was gonna say, before social media, like I live in West Virginia. I wouldn't. What do I care if there's a trans reading hour in San Francisco or something like yeah. that would be 3000 miles or more from where I live? Like, I don't. But now I know what like I wouldn't even know that there's a trans reading group or whatever. Um so it's just we're exposed right. to like the nut picking and the, the sort of the most extreme things that we hate are pushed in our faces. We wouldn't even maybe know about it in a normal, rational world. Right. The stuff that's meant to get you angry is the stuff that's, that's going to come through your feet. And then sometimes it does filter down. You know, we went to Lano, Texas, where they're having one of these library controversies. And one of the things that a number of different people told us as we were going around talking to people in the community is that politics had just gotten meaner. Once that once people started arguing about what was going to be in the library, just like people who were perfectly friendly before, even if they had political differences, now they're not talking to each other. Everything has just taken on this really kind of nasty edge to it. And that's really unfortunate. All right. Well, I probably should get you guys out of here. Any, uh, what would you leave us with? Is it something hopeful, optimistic, or just insightful? What, what should we, uh, what should we know? Well, I think that we can, that the, the place we end the book is, uh, you know, normally when you, when you get to the end of a book like this, you're supposed to say like, what should we do now? And we, one thing we did not want to do was say like, here's our 10 point plan for, for rural redevelopment. Because, you know, we're not rural economists, and there's a lot of those. If you want to go and look online, you know, you can go to Brookings and stuff like that. They've got plenty of those. But what we argue for is a kind of a renewed rural movement that is multiracial and that draws the connections between all rural people, whatever their, whatever their race, whatever their religion, that comes up with a rural agenda that they can present to both parties and to say, this is what we need. This is what we want our communities to look like. This is what we want government to do for us. And says to the politicians they elect, can you do this for us? And then if they say yes, 
then comes back four years later and says, did you do that for us? And holds them accountable. One of the biggest problems they have in rural America is that they're not holding politicians accountable. They are, they keep electing the same people over and over. And because as we were talking about the idea that, you know, the economics and the, the conditions of, of life don't seem like politics is going to be a place where that's, those problems can be solved. That just lets, lets all the politicians off the hook. So they have to put them back on the hook and create a rural movement that actually holds politicians to account. And that's how you get what you need from politics. Oh, looks like Tom. Is Tom, is Tom on uh, mute? I think you muted yourself, Tom. Uh-oh. We <laughs> made sorry. it all this way. <laughs> and especially hold the Republicans accountable, right? I'm sorry, I was putting myself on mute because I have this cold and I didn't want to cough. You know, every time something happens wrong in the city, you hear Democrats are to blame and whatever. But like I said, if you're from Oklahoma, where Trump carried every county, you're represented during the Trump administration by a nonstop chain of command from president and vice president right down to sheriff by not just Republicans, but conservative white male Republicans who are never held to count. And, you know, it wasn't us that started this argument. It was Kevin Williamson, as you know, who wrote Big White Ghetto, who said, don't rural Americans have agency? Don't they hold their politicians accountable? And unfortunately, they don't. One of the things we found that the three things that help revitalize rural communities are one, quality education in schools, two, rural broadband, right? And three, reproductive uh, access for young girls and women, whether married or not, so they can have children and families when they're ready, not when you know they're not. And guess who is opposing reproductive choice and education? And guess who's blocking education expansion? And guess who's teaming up with the telecom companies to block local rural broadband communities so they can all all the business can go to Comcast and the big providers, the Republicans, the very people that they troop to the polls and vote for uh, every two years, every four years. But I'm told most of them are many of them are good people. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm also a Republican. Um, yeah. There are registered. a lot of good Republicans. There are some good ones. Plenty of good ones. <laughs> Uh, and that's what and that's what we see, you know, as I, I don't know if we said this already, one of the things we say is if they want to start voting for Democrats, that's, that's fine. But at the very least, they need to get themselves better Republicans. All right. Fascinating discussion about a controversial book. Um, thank you. It's called I get the book. It's called White Rural Rage, The Threat to American Democracy. Tom Schaller and Paul Waldman. Thank you for coming on the news. Thanks, Thanks so much. Man. This was Matt. a great talk. What a pleasure.